Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm Kristen Boddy. I'm the Membership and Museum Events Manager at the Asheville Art Museum. I want to thank you all for joining us for our second virtual members only program. We have 68 people signed up for today's program. It looks like people are still logging in. So I'll probably pause again in a little bit to just go over some general housekeeping for those who are tuning in a little late. Um, but some of you joined us last week, so thanks for joining us again. And for those who are new, welcome. Before I turn this over to Whitney Richardson, who will be leading today's program, I just want to go over some general information with you. Uh, first, your microphones are muted and your video is turned off by default. You should note that we're recording today's program, and if you prefer not to be recorded, um, be sure to leave your audio and video off. Um, this recording will be shared in the next museum eblast. And you have two options today for asking questions or making comments. The first is to type your question or comment into the chat box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. And if your screen is small like mine, it might be under the button that says more. So if you click on that, you should see an option that says chat. Whitney will read these questions when she gets to a good stopping point, and I encourage you to enter your questions as we go. That will prevent any dead air, so to speak, um, as we wait for others to ask their questions. Um, the second option is to raise your hand by clicking the raise hand button, which you will find by clicking on participants at the bottom of your screen. When there's time, I will call on anyone with a raised hand and unmute your audio so you can ask your question directly to Whitney. Um, and I recommend having your screen set to speaker view rather than gallery view, which can be found in the top right corner. And I see that someone else may have briefly shared their screen. Um, try not to do that today if you can, where we just want Whitney to be able to share hers in the presentation that she's about to give. Um, and so finally, if you feel that there's anything we can do to improve this format within Zoom, please let us know. This is all very new to us and we want to make it as great as possible for you. Um, after this program's over, I'll send you a program evaluation so you can share your feedback that way or email me directly. So thank you again for being here. And now I'll turn this over to Whitney, who I believe needs to share her screen again. There we go. Hi. I hope you can all hear me okay. All right. Now I'm still my when someone else shared their screen, I am still having trouble sharing mine. Let's try this again. Going to share the screen. There we go. Let me open up the chat box so I can see what you all are saying. All right, I think we've got it. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's see, this first screen here, Kristen, you went over this. Do you need to go over this? We went over that already, so you can move okay. on. Just want to make sure. All right, here we go. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, nice to see you all virtually on tiny little screens. Um, thanks for joining me. Today we're going to be taking a tour of our third floor core gallery, and that's the Judith S. Moore Gallery. 
Um, and as you, I hope, know, there's an exhibition there um, installed right now called 50 Years of Western North Carolina Glass. And that is from the uh, James and Judith Moore collection. All right, I'm gonna make sure I'm getting, if, every, if anyone's chatting with me, I wanna make sure I'm seeing that, all right. I got a hi from Hillary, hi. <laughs> all right, so we'll start here. I thought we'd start back in the museum since um, I know I miss it. I, I think you all probably do as well. So we start with a photograph of this third floor core gallery. Um, the title, 40 Years of Western North Carolina Glass, um, just as it suggests, um, highlights that Jim and Judy Moore, I'll be informal with them, Jim and Judy, um, they've been collecting glass since around 1980. Uh, what you see in this exhibition is just a portion of their collection that they have gifted or have promised to the museum. Um, and the Moores focus their collection on glass from artists in Western North Carolina, although they do uh, have some from outside of the region. Um, but today we're going to look at even more specific than Western North Carolina, we're going to look at three artists in their collection. And these artists are important to the history of Studio Glass um, in our region. And our region is important to the history of Studio Glass in the United States. Um, and these three are important within the Moores collection because they started collecting them so early and continued so diligently um, throughout these artists' careers um, that we are able to really show the full spectrum of these artists' careers and what they made over the course of many years. And these three artists that I keep mysteriously referring to, of course, are, um, well, I'm gonna move my screen here, are uh, Harvey K. Littleton, uh, Mark Pizer, and Richard Ritter. Back on, there we go. Next one. Um, some of you, I hope all of you, um, we're able to see this exhibition before we had to close, um, but today we're gonna go through each artist um, and really get to look up close. I've done an art break in November um, that perhaps some of you were at, and um, I was thinking about it, like, oh, wouldn't it be great to really be there to see these artworks with sun coming in the windows and get to see this glass come to life. But in a way, getting to see it on your screen allows you to see it so much more close up. Um, some of them, are better than others on screen. Um, but we're also gonna get to look at other images that kind of tell the story of the history of, of glass and glass in the area. So I hope, I hope that's a, a new point for a lot of you. All right, the Moore's interest in collecting was sparked by a paperweight um, that Judy's dad had bought um, in a gallery in Washington, DC in 1973. And it was a paperweight by Richard Ritter. When the Moors learned about Ritter, um, they quickly found out where he was located near the Penland School of Craft. Um, and when they went out there to see more, well, they ended up with this collection. It went well. So here we are with this first, uh, this first piece. Hillary, you said this last week, but it's so strange that I can't hear anyone's reactions, right? I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> All right, um, James and Judith Moore, Jim and Judy Moore, um, as I mentioned, have been collecting glass for the last 40 years, primarily of Western North Carolina makers. Um, and it's this first piece um, that you see here, Moon and Stars by Richard Ritter that really began it all. Um, once the Moors visited Penland and got to know Richard Ritter, um, they also began collecting two other artists in the area, and that was Harvey Littleton and Mark Pizer. They followed all three of these as they progressed through their careers, and I think um, these three artists are so beloved by the Moors and in turn have really been brought into my consciousness of, um, of how important they are because each of these three, um, their willingness to experiment um, with the material, um, their willingness to push boundaries of the material and just try new things um, was really influential in the, in the history of Studio Glass. Um, I'm going to pause here for a moment. Kristen had asked me if I would pause and um, give her a moment to welcome anyone that's just logged in. Hi again. Yes, we have some people who joined just a little late, so I just want to 
take a moment to remind you all that to ask a question or to leave a comment, uh, to either type your comment or question into the chat box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen or under the more button if you have a smaller screen. Um, and you can type your questions as we go and we'll get to them when we get to some good stopping points. And the second option is to raise your hand, which you can find under the participants button at the bottom of your screen. When there's time, I will call on anyone with a raised hand and unmute your audio so you can speak directly to Whitney. Um, so that will just help us with the conversation a little bit. And if you have any questions, you can also send me a private chat message as we go. But now Whitney, back to you. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so let's see the next slide here. Um, before we get to this amazing collection right now that I've built it up, um, I wanted to go back a little bit and talk about glass in general. Um, it's such a ubiquitous material, right? Um, let's try this chat box feature or hand raising, although I believe I, I'm not sure if I can see it when I uh, when you raise your hand, but I can certainly see it when you chat. Let's try this out. Glass. If you had orange juice this morning, or if you had a wine last night and you drank it from a glass, right, let me know. If you looked through your window, if you looked at your mobile phone screen, you were looking through glass, right? It's all around us. Um, glass is everywhere. And I think because of that, because it's everywhere, um, sometimes can be hard to see it as an art form, right? It takes a little bit because you're so used to seeing it. Um, and so I want to go back a little bit and explain why these three artists are so important. It takes us back into history a little bit first. All right, oh great, thank you. Kristen's telling me when you're raising your hand saying, yes, you've, you've drank out of a glass, right? You looked out of a window. Um, so a lot of what we use glass for is made in a factory, right? With huge equipment, large um, staff of people um, all working for this output of glass. Um, here we've got a picture from the Libby Glass Company um, making wine glasses. Um, they were first started in New England um, and then around 1918 moved to Toledo, Ohio. Um, and you can see in the last picture and in this one, the process of making them is repetitive. It's done by a machine, um, but they can make a quick turnout of them. Uh, while we have so many glass artists that work in studios today, I think that can also be taken for granted. And it's important to realize that um, glass making began in factories in the United States, um, either making mass produced things, right, like bottles for beer or wine, uh, glass bottles for medicine or your maple syrup. Um, things that still come in glass bottles today are all made in factories. Um, think about light bulbs, think about laboratory equipment. All right, here we have a, um, an old illustration from the 1870s from Corning Glassworks uh, in New York. They began in 1851 making glass for scientific use, like optics, again, laboratory equipment, windshields, light bulbs, car, the car light bulbs that were made out of glass to begin with. Um, by 1868, they moved to Corning, New York. Um, and by 1915, they had invented Pyrex. Now that's a, a special glass that I bet a lot of you are familiar with. Um, we all have it in our homes. It's a glass that could resist heat expansion. So if you took that wine glass and you put water in it and you put it in your freezer um, and then took it out and it warmed up, it would shatter. Pyrex had the ability that it could be heated, it could be cooled, um, and it was resistant to that shattering. Um, so Corning and Pyrex, they come back a lot in our talk today. I wanted to make sure you knew about those. Uh, right. And here, this is just um, partly a shameless plug for an exhibition that I hope we'll, you will all be seeing soon of Lewis Hine photography at the museum. Um, but it's also really useful because 
um, around 1908, Lewis Hine actually went around photographing the poor working conditions in factories, and some of these factories were glass factories. Um, here he's showing the, the condition of children working in these glass factories. Um, but it, this photograph, again, stresses how you see so many people in this factory, and they're all working together. Uh, they all might have their own role, um, but together they're producing, and they're making an output of this mass-produced glass. Oh, someone says Tyrex is no longer as heat resistant. Uh -huh. I have to take it up with Corning at the end of this. All right, uh, the next one here. Um, uh, the, finally, this is Tiffany Studios. Uh, another example of glass works that were made in a factory, but in this case, it was artistic. And this is a little bit of a turn for us because the artists, of course, we're gonna look at today, um, were making artistic pieces, we're making works of art. Um, at Tiffany Studios, they were making functional objects. They made desk sets, uh, lamps, of course, Tiffany stained glass uh, lamps. They were making vases for decoration in your home. Um, and they're, they're important, and they're going to come up again later in our talk. Um, another example of art glass manufacturers was Steuben. Um, and that was founded in 1903 in Corning. So there's a connection there. And by 1918, Corning Glass Works, this uh, functional laboratory driven glass works also owned Steuben, um, which was an art glass producer. All right, so here we go. We finally made it to the first artist. Um, I'm just reading your notes here as we go. All right, good. Um, so here we have our first artist, Harvey Littleton. Uh, I'll, I'll try out this comment box again. A anyone notice where he was born? Corning, right, right, Corning. Oh, and someone saying light, uh, light bulbs are still made out of glass, of course, <laughs> um, uh, by different companies, um, although Corning was um, kind of a starting point of those. Um, yeah, I like this. Was it destiny? It kind of was. I love the story of Harvey Littleton. He was born in 1922. Um, he is our only artist that we're covering today that has passed away. He died in 2013 in Spruce Pine. Um, and he's shown here in his first workshop uh, studio in Toledo at the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, yeah, I love this picture. You go from this idea of the factory worker in their uniform to him in a suit and tie looking very professional in his um, solo art studio. Um, so born in Corning, Harvey's father was a physicist for Corning Glass. So he was familiar with glass his whole life. His parents were actually um, part of the test run of early Pyrex and his father would bring home samples for his mom to use in baking to see how it was working out. Um, Harvey Littleton is considered the founder of the studio glass movement. Um, and I'm gonna look at a little overview of his training and how he got there. In 1947, he earned his bachelor's degree in industrial design. Um, at the University of Michigan. And from 49 to 51, he taught ceramics at the Toledo Art Museum School of Design. Uh, in 51, he got his MFA in sculpture from Cranbrook, Cranbrook excuse me. Um, and from 52 to 77, he was on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, uh, sometimes as a ceramics instructor, um, but of course also in glass. All right. How many of you, let's see in the comments here, how many of you have ever tried blowing glass? Yeah, Hillary, exactly. I don't know if you can all see Hillary's comment too. It's much harder than you think, right? It's not like blowing a bubble out of soap, um, but that's sort of what it looks like here. One of his earliest attempts, um, that you see here um, is expanded form that he called it. Um, and he's, oh, I'm jealous of this person. I've blown glass in the Czech Republic, that's awesome. Um, this first piece you see here, it's not easy. And this looks like a very simple form, um, but to do it himself um, and to figure out how to do it uh, was very difficult. Here's a, another photo of him 
in his studio. And you can see there's two guys I can kind of count in the corner there um, helping him, but it's no longer a factory. He's, he's got tools that he's using that are for one person, not for a, a large staff in a factory. Um, and he's doing it himself on a smaller scale. Um, in this case here, he's using a, a blow pipe to blow that glass at the end of it, similar to how he would have done that first piece. Um, and this first piece here I have highlighted in the upper left corner, so you can keep that in mind. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of this early glass. Um, in 1962, with the help of Dominic Labino that you see in the photograph on the right, um, Littleton learned to create this smaller scale studio for himself. He learned how to create glass um, with a lower melting point so it didn't have to get as hot so that one person could sort of handle this um, as opposed to a factory setting. Um, and the, he was able to really sculpt it. He wasn't repeating a form again and again. This was um, him taking a creative turn on glass blowing. Dominic Labino, this was fortuitous, <laughs> met Littleton when he was taking evening classes at the Toledo Art Museum. Uh, Labino worked for John Mansville, which was an industrial glass manufacturer. Still, still exists, but with different names at this point. Um, industrial glass manufacturer that made insulation. Um, things like asbestos, fire glass, uh, sorry, fiber glass, um, and was in Milwaukee. When he worked there. He was a scientist and an inventor, Labino was. He held several patents in the U.S. for industrial glass, um, including, this one's really great, including the heat resistant fibers used in space shuttles. So this guy was coming at it from a scientific point of view. Of course, Littleton had his father's scientific point of view in the back of his mind. He's really trying to turn it into an art form. Um, it was Labino that, that helped Littleton set up and make tools. He had to make these tools for himself that didn't exist for um, a small studio to use. And through the glass workshop you see Labino at here in 1962 um, at the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, this was really Littleton's ability then to share all this knowledge with people. He would hold workshops, um, hold classes in Madison when he taught at University of Wisconsin. Um, and that was really how he shared this knowledge. And the little marbles you see in the middle of the screen there are how they would get the glass from John Mansville, um, John's Mansville, Manville, and they would turn it into a fiberglass, but Harvey would turn it into a work of art. Right. Any questions? Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. So he was born in 1910, 1910, died 96. Seven. <laughs> Thank you. All right, this next piece here. Um, so we looked at blowing glass in the bubble shape. Now this is when Littleton was starting to pull the glass. Think of taffy, how you would pull taffy. Um, when the glass is viscous, when it's still a little warm, you can stretch it. Um, and this piece here is small, about four inches tall. It's a paperweight. And um, it made an addition of 500. And I believe the Moors told me this one was given out as a party favor. All right, here we have Littleton in his studio uh, near Penland. Um, in 1977, he retired from teaching at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and it was really here in Western North Carolina that his process opened up. He became influenced by all the other glass artists in the area at that time. So his first class was in 62. From 62 to 77, there's time for all these other artists to learn. And a lot of them settled in the Western North Carolina area. So he was coming from a place where he was one of the first, he was the first person to work with glass to an area that had lots of glass artists. And I think the influence and um, information that they all shared between themselves really helped. Um, he was did I already say this? He was the last of these three artists to move to Penland. Um, Mark Kaiser and Richard Ritter were already in the area. All right, this one, think back to that little brown paperweight. This is, you know, this, that one times 100. This is about a foot tall, two feet wide. Um, and you can see he's really mastered that pulling like taffy. Um, he polishes it now at the end to give it that shiny finish. Um, 
And something else with this piece compared to the brown paperweight um, was the layers of color in it. And this is one I wish we could see up close more in front of, you know, in, in person. But if you can see it, there's layers of orange and yellow kind of expanding out. Um, and that was very precise and very mathematical work that he was doing. Someone asked, was Penland the reason they came to Western North Carolina? Uh, for Richard Ritter and for Mark Pizer, it was. Um, at the point that Littleton came, he was an established glass artist um, and was coming to, you know, be in the community and retire to a lovely area <laughs> and continue to make his art. This one, um, Lemon and Cranberry Lyrical Movement. Um, here he's playing again with colors and layers of colors. Um, and this one is great. You'll notice the other ones, um, alabaster form or brown paperweight expanded form. He's being very practical. He's naming it by its color. He's naming it by what it is, describing it. And here he started to give things um, a very poetic title, lyrical movement. All right, our second artist, Mark Pizer. Um, he began his career as Littleton did as an industrial designer. I think that says something when you have to make your own tools and your own equipment, it helps to have that sort of background. Um, he was also an engineer um, and interestingly a piano player, um, studied piano and composition. Uh, in 1967, um, Mark left his job to take a class at Penland, so there's the answer to your question, um, to go to their new glass studio that they had just opened up. And 67 he arrived and he is still there today. He never left. Um, he became the first resident artist in glass um, and was the first resident until 1971 uh, when he then went on to build his own studio and home in the area. And here he's shown at a 1969 craft show where he's selling some of his pieces. All right, his earliest piece here, um, Mark Pizer. So Littleton's really the father of all this. He starts it. Mark Pizer is the scientist. Um, he uh, is a master of glass. Um, he's an innovator. He decides that he can't find anything out about glass chemistry, so he teaches himself glass chemistry. Um, and he made a name for himself, has made a name for himself as this throughout his career. Um, and so I've got his first little vase from the Moore collection that we have here. What does this iridescent glass remind you of? Yeah, Tiffany, oil on water. I like that. Yeah, this iridescent, um, oily kind of texture to it. Um, this is something that he began with. And I love this idea that he began with something that seems so difficult. Um, of course, it reminds us of Tiffany glass, right? Um, the Tiffany Studios factory, um, which again, a factory, multiple people working on this to produce this style of glass. And Tiffany called it Favril. Um, uh, old French word meaning handmade. Um, and here, um, Mark Pizer has figured this out for himself. Tiffany wouldn't, wasn't going to share their knowledge on this. Um, so he just keeps experimenting until he's able to create it too. And I think that's why at first we see um, such small pieces from him. He's really figuring out the glass chemistry. Oh, dragonflies, I like that. It reminds you of dragonfly wings, right? How they have iridescence to them. So again, here I want to reference back to this early piece, um, Favril glass was patented by Tiffany in 1894. Um, so he's working against the long tradition of this as a secret. Um, at the time, Favril glass was impressive because the color was within the glass itself. It was not just applied on top of it. Um, and Tiffany um, actually won the grand prize at the 1900 Paris World's Fair. I always love when there's a World's Fair connection because so much of what we see in craft and design goes back to World's Fairs. So, um, so impressive that he won the grand prize for it in 1900. All right, Pizer is known for working in series. 
um, throughout his artistic discoveries and creative processes, as he tries one thing out and experiments, um, it sort of leads him into a new series. And if his first series was that um, small Tiffany glass vases, his next um, is called Paperweight Vase Series, that he calls it. Um, in this, he's blowing glass still, just as he was with the Tiffany vases. Um, but blowing it a little bit, drawing on it, and then blowing it even more. And the drawing part on this is done with canes, which are like sticks of colored glass. Um, so drawing, imagine drawing with a crayon and the tip of the crayon just melts into what you're drawing on. He would draw it at a smaller scale and then blow it again to create a bigger base form. Any questions? Don't be shy. All right, our next slide for Mark Pizer. Um, we've talked about him blowing glass, but now he starts to get into an interest in cast glass. We've got some images here in the of him in a studio um, working on pieces of cast glass um, where the hot, hot liquid glass is poured into the mold. Um, and then once that glass has solidified, it's become cool. Um, Pizer will take it out of the mold and polish it. So we're gonna see this is his new way of making glass. All right, our first one here is from his Inner Space series, and this is called Purple Sky. Um, in this series, Pizer is exploring solid volumes as transparent things. Um, he's looking at the sky, he's looking at his hands, he looks at the mountains, um, and light also plays a really big role in this series. Uh, and I, I had to include this quote by him here, which I love. He says, I, I, even reading this, I feel like uh, you can hear his voice. If you think about it, the form of a sculpture of the sky presents some problems. Like, have you ever seen one? Like, where are the edges? <laughs> and I love that he's trying to create the sky um, with edges. And in this case, he does it with uh, the triangular shape that you see here. All right, his next series is Forms of Consciousness. Uh, forms of Consciousness. Um, this one is called Passing Thought, and in this series, he's trying to represent psychological conditions. Um, and this is also where he develops a technique um, called bottom pour casting furnace. Um, think of a soft serve ice cream machine, <laughs> um, but it's not pouring soft serve ice cream, it's pouring liquid glass, right? Molten, uh, molten lava coming out of this thing. Um, pouring it from the bottom into a mold um, and then lets that sit, um, lets it anneal the process of the glass cooling. Um, and glass has to cool very slowly over a very long period of time so that it does not crack or fracture. Um, and then once it's set and cooled, he'll take it out of the mold and go back in and polish it. Um, now this piece, this one's a little different than anything we've seen um, what do you notice about this glass? Would you have even thought it was glass when you saw it? Right, can you see through it? Yeah, no, it's opaque. You can't see through it. Um, even the Tiffany glass, which is pretty thick, um, if you hold it up to the light, you can still see through it. And in this case, yeah, people are saying it looks like clay, it looks like marble. Um, this is called uh, pat de verre which translates from French to glass paste. And in this case, he's using glass powder um, and combines it with a binding agent. And he would try different binding agents to hold those pieces of powder together. Um, but then when you heat it up, it solidifies, becomes this solid piece. Let's see, do you think the white and gray bits are intentional? Or is this the consequence of fabrication process? That's a great question. And that's something that you find again and again in Mark Pizer's work. I would say the first time, maybe it wasn't intentional, and then he figures out why it's doing it, and then does it. <laughs> he, he's very interested in experimentation and failure and testing things out until he gets what he wants. Um, so I do think if he's 
put this piece out into the world and said, here's this artwork, um, he, he means for those marks to be there, but whether they were there knowingly to him before he opened up that mold, I don't know. Oh, I missed the question. How many different series did he do? We're looking at six or seven. Um, I think he's on his eighth or ninth at this point. How long does glass have to sit in the mold? Oh, another good question. This depends. So something really small um, could be in there a short time, maybe a few days. Um, something really big um, could be in there months, could be in there, we'll see a piece that um, later on that took a year to properly anneal. Um, so it really depends on the size of the glass and also the type of the glass that they were using. All right, this next one, this is another one I wish we were there to see in person, but you can get the sense of how it glows a little bit on your screen. Um, this is from his Contrition Second Study Series. Um, he uses opal glass here. Um, and I really see this. Um, I really see this as a next step from form of consciousness, right? To go from form of consciousness to contrition. Um, it seems like he's really focusing in on this one um, psychological condition. Um, and and it's, um, it's hard to see, but imagine the human body curled up, like if you're going to do a somersault in a very um, forgiving way, leaning forward with the human body. This is sort of an abstraction of that form. Uh, someone asked, if you remove the mold too soon, is it ruined? Um, if you remove it too soon from the um, annealing oven where it's cooling at a controlled decrease in temperature, you could ruin the piece, absolutely. All right. This next one is so bright and happy. I like this blue bowl from his Coldstream casting series. Um, again, he's using the bottom pour uh, casting furnace. So think about that soft serve ice cream again. But this time he narrows the hole. Think of a toothpaste tube, right? And the, the control it takes to do these. He is pouring this one into a mold. Um, and he has got the perfect temperature on the glass as it's pouring, where it goes from vitreous when it's coming out of the tube to by the time it hits, it's solidified. Um, and in this case, it, is, it does not remain in a mold. As soon as it's done, it's solidified. He tips it out of the mold and then lets it cool. Um, but this, I mean, the chemistry, the timing that goes into making these is really amazing. Oh, uh, let's see. Is it called opal glass because it contains the gem or because it is opalescent? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, he would experiment with lots of minerals, lots of different um, formulations for his glass. I think it is because it is opalescent. That's a good one. I'm going to have to go back and research that. Um, what are the molds made of? Molds are made of lots of different things. They could be made out of styrofoam. Um, they could be made out of graphite. Graphite can handle a higher temperature um, than styrofoam. Um, and then there's actually, let me see if I wrote that down. In some of, in some of Mark's pieces, he uses a special material um, that can handle even higher temperatures. So all different things. Oh, good. Someone is helping me out. There is no opal <laughs> in the opal glass. All right. Let's see. And this one, this is one of my favorites. Um, this is from the Palomar series. Um, this piece is called Seer 5. Um, and this is a, a really fascinating series. Um, it connects us once again back to Corning and back to Pyrex glass. Um, that we heard about with Harvey Littleton. And it's named after a 200 inch disc, 200 inches, right? Made of a Pyrex glass. Remember, um, that's a special glass that can res resist heat expansion. Um, so it's a little more stable. Um, and this 200 inch disc was used for the mirror for the Hale telescope. Um, still in use on Mount Palomar in San Diego at Caltech. Um, it was, when it was made in 1934, 
it was the single largest piece of glass ever made. Um, and it's been in use since it was installed in 48. So it was made in 34, it was installed in 48. Um, this is our example of a long annealing process. This took about a year to fully um, form and, and completely lower its temperature in the annealing oven. Um, and then it took 11 years to grind and polish it. So the piece we're looking at is by Mark Pizer and it's based on this. This is the actual um, Palomar telescope piece that he based it on. I'm gonna flip back again so you can see he's taking a small little section of this huge um, piece of glass that he was inspired by to make his piece. Um, a couple of things about this um, 200 inch disc inspired him. And the first thing was its failure. The first attempt to make one actually failed and the disc cracked. And you can see it, it's on view at the Corning Glass Museum. Um, but I think that says a lot about him. He thought, oh, they failed, that's interesting. Um, and that's something I really admire about him and his work. Um, he was also inspired by the unexpected semi-translucence of the glass. And you can see that a little bit in the picture on the right. Um, I wish it were in color, but you can get a sense of that semi-translucent magical quality to this glass. Um, the color in his Palomar series, go back again there, um, is affected by its thickness. And you can really see this when you look at it in person and you move and the daylight moves with it. The thinner the glass is, the more blue it is. The thicker, the more orange it looks. And that's a lot like the sky. Um, when we have direct sunlight, our sky is blue. When we have distorted sunlight, like at sunset, um, we get those orange tones to it. Uh, the, the sky itself has been um, a huge theme throughout Mark Pizer's career, no matter which series he's working on. Um, this one uh, from the Etude Tableau series, um, what does it make you think of? This title here is a little, um, a little perplexing. So he's working on a series called Passages. He works on a series called Etude Tableau. Um, and the, here he's combined the title. So he's sort of looking at both of these series, but it's really the Etude Tableau that interests me um, and made me kind of look for more information. Anyone? Remember he was a piano player he was a piano player, and this is actually a piece of music written by Sergei Rachmaninoff, A2 Tableau. And he was inspired to, by this work of music to create a work of glass. Um, not at all representational of a work of music. You don't see um, bars of music here, right? You see the sky. Oh, how large is this piece? This one is about a foot tall, two feet wide. It's like the creation of Earth. That's a beautiful interpretation. Um, yeah, so he named this after a piano piece. Um, in 2019, Mark Pizer was named the Corning Specialty Glass Resident. That's given to one glass artist a year. Um, and he and his assistant spent a year researching glass, um, specifically looking at uh, opal glasses. Um, he was really interested in the hazy quality that um, hot cast phase glass, like the one you see here, um, gets. That hazy quality is created by the suspension of crystals as it cools. Um, and so he spent the year uh, looking at that process. So I can't wait to see what he comes up with next. All right, our third artist today, check on my time. All right. How many pieces are in each series, someone asks. It, it depends. Um, his early Tiffany glass, oh, he must have made thousands. You saw him at that craft fair selling them. Um, and then the bigger and more complicated, um, the less he's able to make. Um, what was I was reading some one year, he only made six pieces because he was experimenting so much. And, and um, that was the output for that one year. So it depends. <laughs> All right, our last artist, Richard Ritter. Uh, born in Detroit in 1940, and here he's in the grooviest outfit you've ever seen, blowing glass. Uh, from 59 to 62, he attended the Society of Arts and Crafts. 
um, in Detroit, now the College of Creative Studies. Um, and he focused on advertising, just like the other two, didn't start out as a glass artist. Um, he actually worked in advertising for a while and then in 68 returned to the Society of Arts and Crafts to, um, to teach advertising. But while he was there, he continued to pursue his own education, studying metalwork. And at this time, the first glass studio opened there. So he quickly signed up for glass making um, and from then on was a glass artist. Uh, in 69, he worked in Michigan at the Bloomfield Art Association where he was um, building the glass making facility and the curriculum to teach students with. Um, let's see, this was actually the first time he began working with Marini, which is something we'll talk about here in a minute. In 71, Richard Ritter first traveled to Penland to study with Mark Pizer and with another glass artist named Richard Marquis, also known for his Marini, which we'll look at. Um, and in 73, after Mark Pizer, he became um, the next artist in residence at Penland. I see a question pop up over here. Did the knowledge of how to use chemicals to produce different colors come from the industrial glass world or developed experimentally by artists? I think a little bit of both on that one. Um, you saw with the marbles from the Johns Manville, there were certain colors that were already available. And then as the artist became more familiar with it, more knowledgeable on the chemistry of glass, they started to add different things. There's there's one account where at some point Richard, not Richard, Mark Kaiser was adding uh, rat poison <laughs> just to see what it would do. And he said it created bubbles. So they, they were trying everything out. All right, Marini, let's talk a little bit about these. I think they can be a little confusing, but, uh, but lots of fun. Um, so it's a Venetian Italian, right? Venetian glass blowing technique um, that just like Tiffany for Mark Pizer was uh, a bit of a secret. So Richard Ritter and his colleagues um, like Richard Marquis had to figure this out for themselves. Um, the first part of the process is to take canes of glass. So you have colored glass that you pull out into a stick and you see that in the back row. You'd make them in all different colors. You have reds and blues and greens in the back. Um, uh, think of it again, just like taffy. You're pulling taffy um, with these sticks. The ones in the front row, the colors have been combined. You can see they were sort of swirled together. And then uh, the canes that you see, the canes that you see here are heated up again and pulled very thin. They could be pulled to the diameter of a thread or they could be very thick. Um, when they are heated up and put together, um, you can blend them into a picture. Here we see it could be a dinosaur, um, it could be a flower, it could be an abstract form. And that's really the beauty of Richard Ritter, that he can do all sorts of different designs. He um, has a famous series of portraits in his as well. Um, so then once these pieces are put together to make a picture and cooled, you can then slice this stick Think of it like a loaf of bread. And so each slice will be identical. All right, so here we have slices. Um, and they've been put onto a hot, uh, a warmed up slab of glass. And they're being held on the end. The rod is called the punty, where it's got a, a bit of glass on the end to hold um, the slab of glass. And so here, the slices have been laid out and it looks like this artist is going to roll it up into a cylinder shape. And then at that point you could blow part of it, you could hot work part of it with a torch to pull different things in different directions. Um, but that's sort of how the basic of how marinis are used. Right. Here we are back at our first one again. This was the, the piece that piqued the Moore's interest. Um, in Western North Carolina glass. And now that we know a little bit about Marini's, where do you see Marini's in this piece? Yeah, the stars, exactly. The stars are from a long piece of glass that had a star going through the middle of it and then he sliced it. Um, put it into glass that he then blew, so it made this round form. This next piece by Richard Ritter um, is an early piece of his as well. 
uh, it's a vase and it has latticino in it. So you can see in the description over there how that's spelled. Um, it's again using canes, but rather than pulling it into strands and combining it to make a picture, you sort of overlay it like lattice or like lace. I got my 10 minute warning and I lost my place. All right. Um, this piece was made um, just before Richard Ritter and his wife, Jan Williams, also a glass artist, moved from Michigan to Bakersville, North Carolina um, in 1980, um, where they remain today. And he established his own studio. All right. The Grail series. Um, this came into being in the 1990s. Um, it's composed of a large platter. Again, you can see the Marini really clearly in this one. Um, and that platter is put on top of a faceted piece of glass as the base. So it's made out of two pieces. This piece is just one of my favorites. I think it is so sweet. Um, in the 90s, he also began to experiment with etched copper and putting that into the surface of his glass works. Um, as you see in the paperweight here, the ladybug is made out of copper. In the 2000s, getting closer to present day, um, Ritter began working on a new series that he called his Floral Core series. Um, and these, again, everything you see there is Marini, um, put into molds or blown out so that they expand as they um, get put into a new form. And these are so heavy. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to have gotten to install it and feel just how heavy this work is. So this would have taken so much technical skill to do. Uh, in the mid 2000s, he began making apples. Um, and the Moors in their collection that they've given to the museum have this prototype that he made for the first apple. And it's a sweet little piece, too. It's about three inches tall. Um, and it was just him attempting to make an apple. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Nancy Desmond asked, what size is this piece? I bet you meant the floral core. Um, this one's pretty big. It's about nine inches tall and about 18 inches wide, uh, 16 inches wide, maybe a little less. Here we go. Here's Richard Ritter and his wife, Jane Williams, in 2014 in their shop in Bakersville. And you can see they're working on an apple at the end there. And of course, if he's going to make an apple, it's going to have Marini and Latticino in it. Um, I think that this is a great piece to end on, um, not only because it highlights what Richard Ritter is known for with his whimsical apples, um, with the Marini and Latticino, um, but let's all take a moment and look at the title of this work. So we know these came from the collection of Judy and Jim Moore, and this piece, um, Judy's Candy Apples, was made for Judy Moore, um, and I think nothing could pay tribute better to their um, true love of this form of glass, um, of these three artists um, and their, their relationships as they've supported them throughout their careers. Um, nothing could mean more than getting it named after you. So I love that this is called Judy's Candy Apples. Um, and it, it might be a little difficult to see that frosted glass on the bottom actually has um, an etched branch and leaves in it. Where do the Moors live? They are in Virginia. How long will this be on display? That's a great question, Laurel. I'm not sure. It's still up at the moment, um, and we're working on our schedules for the magical day when we all come back to the museum. Uh, I have some more images of the installation I wanted to share with you and, and kind of point out some of the um, very intentional pairings of glass and the um, color field paintings we put in this gallery. Um, the Kenneth Snelson North, South, East, West. Um, along with the Harvey Littleton um, interlocking alabaster form. They both have these horizontal strong lines of color. Of course, Dan Christensen's Bellatrix, which is now on view in um, reverberations. Um, the idea there was to pair it with Harvey Littleton's lyrical movement. 
And again, the, um, another view, the George Byer line, it really picks up on all the magical colors that are used in this glass. And I love how it's um, soft finish in the colors that he used in the painting. Um, really go with the soft finish of Mark Pizer's um, Palomar series and A2 Tableau there just underneath it. Let's see, who are the people behind the AAM host and co-host? <laughs> All right, well, um, thank you so much. I'll open it up if you have any other questions. I'm happy to answer. Um, and I really thank you all for joining me on this tour today. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions at this time, I just want to thank Whitney for her great presentation. And if you do have any follow-up questions, uh, we have a couple more minutes if you want to ask now. Otherwise, you can feel free to email me and I'll compile them and send them to Whitney. Um, and as a reminder, I'll send out a program evaluation in a little bit to get your feedback about today's conversation with the curator. And we're scheduling special member only programming every week until we reopen. So look out for your email every Monday about what we have planned. Thank you for joining us today. Stay well, and I hope to see many of you again next week. So thank you. And do you see any more questions, Whitney? Um. One just popped up, as you said it. Do the Ritters ever open their studio for visits? You know, I don't know. They do have a website, though. He's very easy to find online, um, and you can always contact them through that. Okay, great. Well, I think we'll end on that note. And great. thank you all again, and thank you, Whitney. All right. Have a Thanks, good everyone. afternoon. Bye.